There is no security against the ultimate development of mechanical consciousness in the fact of machines possessing little consciousness now. A mollusk has not much consciousness, reflects upon the extraordinary advance which machines have made during the last few hundred years, and note how slowly the animal and vegetable kingdoms are advancing. The more highly organised machines are creatures not so much of yesterday as of the last five minutes, so to speak, in comparison with past time. Assume, for the sake of argument, that conscious beings have existed for some 20 million years. See what strides machines have made in the last thousand. May not the world last 20 million years longer? If so, what will they not in the end become? Is it not safer to nip the mischief in the bud and to forbid them further progress? And that was someone writing not in the 1960s or now about artificial intelligence, but in the early 1870s. Yeah. In New Zealand. In New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that that was a reading from um, the Book of the Machines in uh, Samuel Butler's novel Erewhon. You are, in case you're wondering, listening to a podcast about buildings and cities. Um, I'm Luke Jones. I'm George Gingell. We're kind of writing the prequel to one of the first episodes we did. Way back in episode three, we were interested in a series of dystopias which came out during the early part of the 20th century, kind of in the 20s mostly, in which the I- ideas of industrial efficiency became kind of nightmarishly extended to the formation of society and the individual subject more generally. We are going back in time about 50 years from that point and looking at, well, I guess another series of sort of utopia slash dystopias. They're more at the utopian end. Utopias and satires, yeah. I would say. They're either utopias or they're satirical. N- none of the societies are really worse than our own. Yeah. They're just... Strange. Strange. <laughs> um, <laughs> from a period when the kind of exciting potential of the machine was all that much fresher. It's sort of the beginning of the period where it's definite... If you think of man in the 18th century, it was still generally thought of that the future would be more or less the mm. same as the past. And over the course of the first half to two thirds of the 19th century, it became obvious that that wasn't the case. Suddenly, you could get on a train and go across Europe in a day or two. Uh, Suddenly, all sorts of things that were unimaginable to previous generations were happening. And that was overturning old orders of society. But it's still the world where it seems like things are definitely getting better. Yes. Partly because the social conditions were so bad before. And I think these exist at a period when perhaps that's the assumption that might be just about beginning to be questioned. But it's still the mainstream assumption. Yeah. So the story I want to begin to tell begins with the Crystal Palace, unless this kind of famous icon of the incipient machine age that appeared in Hyde Park in the early 1850s than its retelling, kind of fantastical retelling, in the novel What is to be Done. All, all the books we're looking at have, have, a, have like a title and subtitle, sometimes two subtitles. Yes. An Urgent Question, What is to be Done, by Nikolai Chernyshevsky, which appeared in 1863 and which was written in exile in Siberia and serialised. The protagonist is this woman, Vera Pavlovna, who's kind of struggling, who's fighting her own kind of fight. She does things like setting up a union and these kinds of things. I mean, this book was hugely successful. So what happens is that there's her fam- Vera Pavlovna has a famous dream which happens about uh, 80% of the way through, in which she is being told things by this person referred to as the Shining One, this female figure all lit up in lights, glowing with this intense uh, sort of radiance and perfection, and who's showing her different historical scenarios. And the question is, what's the scenario in which you as a woman can exist on equal terms with men, in which, like, the emancipation of women will have been achieved? And they go through various historical scenarios princesses or empresses and things that she could have been but in each case the discovery is that that person wasn't really free either and eventually they reach this fantastical location which is the crystal palace which is explicitly based on the one erected for the great exhibition of 1851 but 
it's like a much better version of it. This is a classic <laughs> trope of these things, which is like, it's like the most high-tech thing that we that exists so far, but better than it. But way better. Usually bigger and more shiny. Also, at that point, the shining one reveals herself to be none other than Vera herself, but in her kind of perfected condition. Then you kind of have a bit of a trip around what the Crystal Palace is, and it is a kind of utopian community. It's a community of about a thousand people. They live together in this enormous glass house in which everything is made of the wonder, the wonder material of aluminium and glass. It's, it's a wondrous material. Yeah, so light. So shiny. Doesn't rust. And they produce all of their own food. I'll, get, I'll read a little bit. An edifice, an enormous, enormous edifice, such as can only be seen in the largest capitals. Or no, at the present, there is none such in the world. It stands amid fields of grain, meadows, gardens and groves. The fields of grain, this is our grain. They are not such as we have now, but rich, rich, abundant, abundant. Is it wheat? Whoever saw such heads? Whoever saw such grain? Only in forcing houses is it possible to make such heads of wheat, such royal grain. The meadows are our meadows, but such flowers as these are now found only in flower gardens. Orchards are full of lemon trees, oranges, peaches, apricots. How can they grow in the open air? Oh yes, there are columns around them. They are opened in summer. Yes, these orangeries are opened for the summer. And so, I mean, this is very much the tone. <laughs> yeah. <It's kind> of <laughs> yeah, the, the Russian ones are, are extraordinarily... Um... Not effusive, like ecstatic. Yeah, it's totally ecstatic. You know, as the description goes on, what you, what you see is that people are out doing the harvest, but it's this harvest which is facilitated by all of these wondrous machines. And the machines are all out enabling them to carry out the harvest very, very fast. And then they all go back and they all dine together. Uh, and the, I mean, the community is definitely seems to be modelled on Charles Fourier's description of a kind of ideal community, the phalanstery, which is a little bit like this sort of secular monastery where everyone lives together. And the idea is that to create an ideal community, you just need to get the right group of people so that everyone can find exactly the place that they want. He had a theory that there were exactly something like 1,400 personality types or something and that your ideal community would have to have one of all of them and then everything will be fine god knows what happens if it's like sort of bruno Schatz's insane world where yeah, like yeah, yeah. the city will be perfect because all alike people will congregate together and it's like a big family isn't it it's like one big family it's like a, it's like a big family it's like a yeah it's like a kind of communal it's the location in which this sort of ultimate freedom from all these different forms of tyranny whether it's the tyranny of, of work, of hunger, or of patriarchal domination, or all of these other things are finally removed. You kind of, the spectacle is of people working, but they're working in kind of great ease and very happily. As they go harvesting the grain, there's like an enormous big awning which slides over the top of them so that they're kept out yeah. of the sun. Later on, they travel somewhere else and you see one of these which is in the desert and it has a whole different set of technologies which enable it to be sustained in the desert with sort of spraying water and things. And obviously the implication is that these have covered the whole um, surface of the earth at a suitable distance from one another. Yes. You've always got to have lots of space. Space is super important. Well, one thing to say is that in a way which I hadn't really appreciated before, it creates a complete obsession in Russia with like crystal palaces and glass cities, which goes all the way on until until we, which we spoke about in episode three. It's really the default location of these kind of science fictional utopian novels. The enthusiasm which people like Tau, Bruno Taut have for glass cities, I feel, feel like in, in Russia people have already gone through one kind of cycle of satire, cynicism reappropriation of this kind of image. It almost image. goes like sort of satire, ecstasy, dystopia or something. Do you, uh, do you want to go through any more of the particular characteristics of this society, like as opposed to the other forms that we, we're going to see? There's a lot of attention towards the everyday things of life. So the kind of dinner that you have, the point is made that this is a kind of dinner that you might have once or twice a year in contemporary society, but which they have every day. And, you know, they they talk about the plates and the cutlery and the tables and all of these sorts of things. And they're all made of these kind of wonder materials. It's aluminium It's everywhere. all aluminium. Uh, it's like the 60s, basically. <laughs> yeah. It sort of is like the 60s. It's like, suddenly we can have spam every day and <laughs> boiling the 
boiling the bag. Everything like we were freed from labour. Yeah, there are one or two things which I thought were worth highlighting. There's this something which seems to reoccur a lot, which is the relationship between what the machine is going to allow our society to do and the status of women and the demand for women to be kind of emancipated from their existing role in society. Yeah, women specifically, and the entire structure of the family also in general. The political family of the 18th century is looking very shaky in the mid-19th century. You know, women essentially as property, male authority. Like, it's looking totally unsustainable. Um, But what will become of society when it changes? Uh, and there's lots of different attempts at solving this. This one's kind of like the families we know it will cease altogether. Yeah, people have passed into these new sorts of social structures, I guess. It's kind of like a commune, but I don't think that the family has exactly been abolished. Women haven't quite been freed from... (laughs) They uh, never have. Yeah. Bit of a spoiler. None of the 19th century utopias quite managed to make the jump. Yeah, there's obviously technology, there's the machines kind of as this liberating, having this liberating potential. And then there's also something about what life is. I think that this figure of the radiant Tsarita, as she appears to herself, the shining one, is important because it gives a certain kind of image of a kind of life force or energy. What like a a fully imagined life might be like is this sort of transcendent kind of spiritualization of life as potential or life as as like energy it's interesting in not all to the same extent but in all of the books there is a woman character who is not usually the protagonist in this case sort of is and sort of isn't at the same time who's normally the a kind of romantic target, but is also, in some sense, the physical personification of the perfect society, who is this radiant metaphor yeah. for what it's all going to be like. And she's, like, stunningly beautiful, kind of glowing in one way or another, somehow embodying the attributes of this utopian society that the description of the utopia's kind of physical conditions cannot satisfy okay should we talk about well should we go on to talking about Erewhon but talk about Vril by way of introduction to it so the um Samuel Butler's Erewhon I think we're going to probably start by talking uh, introducing actually the text which it was mistakenly thought to be a sequel to at the time of its publication so uh, Butler was a completely unknown author and his literary reputation essentially entirely consists in that the book was released anonymously and was misidentified as a sequel to this very successful fantasy called Vril by Edward Bulwer-Lytton, who's like one of the major novelists of the period. He was one of the most successful novelists of the early 19th century. His big hits were released really in the 1830s and 40s. And then after then, he kept writing, but he was a politician. He was a liberal politician cabinet minister, minister for the colonies, which was a big job back then. And this came right at the end of his career. And it's a kind of fantasy slash slightly Swiftian satire. It's kind of difficult to determine work that he is quite indulgent, um, but equally mega successful uh, called, yes, Vril uh, or The Coming Race. It's not quite as racist well, yes. as it sounds, although Vril, it does have a little bit. Vril, a story of the coming race. Or the new utopia. It begins kind of like a Jules Verne novel or something. It, st- it starts off. It gets off to the races incredibly quickly. Yeah, the um, the there's the chap. He's there. They're doing some he's kind an of American. They're doing some kind of geological expedition. His they've they've like abseiled down something. His friend sees a strange light shining through the rock, and they say, "Well, we must go down and visit that. That's very mysterious." And then they go down there, and then the first thing that happens is that his friend, first of all, falls to his death and destroys all the climbing equipment, and then is immediately eaten by an enormous lizard, which forces into yes. a, which is a, a rare double deus ex machina. To force, um, to force it. <laughs> and, and actually, like, the novel has gone from, I'm an American uh, with plenty of money. Uh, I, got, I was bored at home in the family business, so I went overseas to this mine. <laughs> and all of that is accomplished in about four pages. Um, and then we're off to the races. Uh, and 
um, he is discovered by this mysterious sort of master race with wings yeah. called called the Vril Yar. The Vril Yar, yes. I mean, he's uh, having having run through a crack in the rock, he, like, discovers... Well, it's essentially like an underground... It's a sort of underground Tuscany. Yeah, but everything is lit. It's a hollow... There's a whole genre of kind of hollow-earth fantasies that's yeah. been going on for ages. A little bit earlier than this, there's... um. Uh, Jules Verne's The Journey to the Centre of the Earth. I mean, so Vril then, fr- from that point, it unfolds as utopias are wont to do. There's the visitor who has accidentally penetrated this kind of strange hidden society, uh, who then encounters a lot of people who sort of show him around and explain how things came to be that way. And there are, there's an awful lot of dimensions of that. It's Yeah, and, and also there's some more sort of funny deus ex machina. It's all sort of, like at the beginning, he can't understand these, like they're super haughty and beautiful and the women are all like eight foot tall and muscular and super finely featured with giant wings. But don't worry, he's like zapped through the magic wand and um, can um, learns learns rather like Neo in the Matrix to speak the language in his sleep. So maybe before we go, there are an awful lot of eccentric details. But maybe before we go on to that, we should say something about this the titular substance Vril, which is yeah. a kind of mystical liquid, which is a bit like life energy or life force. Because yeah. Vril is like he says, it's like the force somehow a combining of Faraday's electricity and magnetism with the vital energy of life. And it, yeah, it gives them kind of superpowers, but it also infuses all sorts of other things as well. So that the, I mean, their, their machinery. It's powered by the life force. Yeah, it sort of has, the, the descriptions of it, it has the quality more of sort of Habsburg court automata or something. They're yeah, very they're all, fine we brass. We don't have the word ro- robot yet. Yeah. It doesn't exist. This is the way robot, I think really comes in in the 20th century and so he calls them all automata and the work is mostly done by like these sort of humanoid robots all the servants in the house are the, these robots and they all kind of stand still and then the vril yar have got these vril yar sticks and um they can sort of wave their magic wand at these robots and they're they're kind of mechanical devices but they're powered by life energy that seems to be one of the one of the kind of thematic problems or dilemmas which people are are dealing with in some of these books is what the difference between the kind of machinic energy and life life energy is is there some special how unsettling is it if the machines actually through their ability to move and to do all, all sorts of other things you yeah know, do they uh, actually have the properties of in life? a way this is a less sophisticated view but i think one that's a useful view to understand coming on to it which is um, Bulwer Lippmann was an old guy, and his science was a bit old hat by this point. You know, he's still talking about Lyle, and and he's got a really strange view of evolution and things. And he, it's kind of vitalism, which is this idea that life, the life force is sort of electricity or something to do with it, and that's why you can also use electricity to move muscles. Is it Galvani? Italian? Yeah, there's galvanism, and there's there's mesmer and mesmerism, which is sort of connected to the idea of of um, a specifically animal magnetism, yeah. that, the, that there is a particular force or force field within the living, yeah, the, so like, living body. There's this like stuff which is also what consciousness is made of. It's kind of like invisible electricity, but you can kind of potentially bend it with the power of your mind. And this was a sort of semi accepted pseudoscience. It wouldn't have been thought any more ridiculous than like homeopathy or something. And that's sort of what how the Vrilyar works. Suddenly they have understood and mastered this power which is electricity and life and they can make machines living, power robots and their society and light and heal and but also hypnotise. Yeah, so the Vril, the Vril can extend life. It can kind of wondrously enhance your capacities. Yeah. It's also a weapon of mass destruction. The way the society works, um, which is kind of funny, is like all of these things, um, lives for a really long time. They're super beautiful and strong and powerful and lovely. The standard lifespan in these utopias, all of them is like 100, maybe 150. And the way... Vril society is is they live in small communities of no more than like a few thousand people because that's the ideal society they don't harm anything that doesn't harm them so one of the jobs in the society is to like gather up all the rabbits and move them off and then provide them with like rabbit food 
and they're all vegetarians. Except occasionally, if there is something that um they don't like, they have a solution. When you're a baby, you have like a couple of years off, and then you do your national service. You work for the government from I think like the age of two till you're like in your late teens and you become an adult. And then after people are adults, they no longer ever have to work because you get this massive salary from the government when you're a child. That's how the Vril live. And the first job of the really young children is um, as exterminators. They are given like these like sticks of mass destruction. And because infants, he says, are the most in tune with the the powers of destruction and have a natural urge to kill. (laughs) He begins to see that he's not being completely serious. Like he's slightly liking to invert some factors of 19th century society. So, for example, there are those giant lizards, which are a bit pesky. There's a funny bit where the protagonist is going, oh, we're going to go and, go and kill that giant lizard that was going out. And, oh, how are we going to do that? Well, it's lurking in there, but it won't come out if it sees I'm there because it knows I'll kill it. So uh, you've got to go and stand on that rock over there. <laughs> and he's like, I didn't want to do it. And then the little boy hypnotizes him and sends him out to stand on the little rock to clear out the 30 foot long lizard. And then the 30 foot long lizard is zapped to a crisp in an instant. Yes, with the Vril Wand. With the Vril Wand. And the society is organised on the basis that of um, dictatorship, benign dictatorship. In each sort of role, there is one dictator. And where there hasn't been a decision made, someone is picked at random and given absolute authority over that decision. And no one wants to be the leaders because there's no advantage to being the leader. In fact, everyone sort of doesn't want to. and is very demure about it. But out there in the in the world, there are these hideous barbarians who are democratic. And, these, and they're savages. And they breed like rabbits because they don't have the, the controlling. And they build up in these big societies. And then they can't be sustained in their area. And, and then they might make, you know, try and make inroads into the Vril way of life. And then they unleash the children on them. And it says, maybe exterminate 60 million here or there. It's not really a utopia. It's kind of funny. The machines are kind of part of the mise-en-scene of this society. But equally, they're not really... Because they have these magic wands... The machines aren't really doing anything. They're kind well, of... They're, he you goes know, to a factory and he goes to a farm... And all the work in them is done by the machines, by these, like, automata. And there are a couple of people around who are, like, trying to work out how to op- process optimise all the robots. But essentially, the reason that no adults have to work is that all the work is done by machines, but which are all private property. And some people are really rich and some people aren't. But everyone's earned so much when they were a child that it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, the machines are kind of... It's kind of a magical thing. Although he does talk a lot about how people are like optimizing the processes and how how the farm is like a watch i think that like the watch is definitely the paradigm the kind of particular machine paradigm yeah. the machines are, how, are often very beautiful in their movement and in their and very fine in their materiality so they're like basically gold yeah those, those are gold in all these things the adults do mainly have fun, so they, they do um, wing flying dances with their pneumatic. It turns out the wings are like a mechanical device. Um, and the other th- dominant strange thing about the society is the role of women, which is that uh, the women are all like much bigger than the men and um, have more destructive powers. And this has meant that there's a different power balance between men and women yeah the men the men are sort of cherished the men are cherished <laughs> firstly the children um have like the supreme power of destruction so there's no bossy children around but they're super dutiful and all kind of like really wise and sort of sage-like little kids little little kids with this sort of power of life and death yes yeah, so the women are bigger and more powerful uh they also choose their partners And the men are all, like, continually bashfully uh, waving off the sort of oppressive suits of all of these women. Yeah, so it's kind of of the inversion of the the sort of classic ballroom dynamic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All all the men are constantly, (laughs) like, sort of... Hiding behind their fans. Hiding behind their (laughs) fluttering... They're, like, literally, like, (laughs) fluttering their lashes and... um, demurely backing off and 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 he's amazed at how artfully and how demurely all the all the men um uh, managed to brush off the attention of all these amazonian uh, super women super women but then when a man and a woman agree to get married which they do on a short-term three-year contract always the woman stops being able to fly rather like all these societies in in all these utopias essentially what the 
the male authors want is they want women to be liberated and to do whatever they want and then to choose to be submissive housewives <laughs> which is kind of how it kind of how it rolls they're like death sticks lose the death power and just get to keep the healing power for the three years and then at the end of that the man decides whether he wants to stay married or not for another three years so they either break apart or stick together or, or no or he can choose to have another wife in addition um and there's a lot of strange sublimated sort of sexual fantasy i think going on yes bit of a kink bull Litton is enjoying playfully tearing apart victorian values yeah i think he's having a bit of fun with that and in fact the plot such as it is is a romantic plot where the strangers come in and he's very exotic and um one of the women takes a shining to him but if they have any kids because he's so degenerate like he's got you know they've evolved to not have canine teeth and um because they don't eat meat they're vegetarians and they're so and he's so imperfect and savage um, they'll just exterminate him if there's any risk of any any hanky panky. So he's like in the state of terror in the society because he doesn't really know how to like be one of these like bashful men continually pushing away the women and that kind of drives the plot. But one thing is that that the author is sort of terrified that the the Vril Yar are going to come up and um, like come into the over overground and exterminate everybody and turn the earth into a giant plantation with their superior powers and. The, and their sort of superior ethics, and they're going to supersede us. Yeah. It's called the coming race because they're going to supersede humanity. Yes, the coming, not the coming race because we're going to turn into them, but because they're going to exterminate us. Yeah, because they are both sort of, according to themselves, morally superior. Although he doesn't think they're morally superior, obviously, with their like genocidal mania, and they're enormously technologically superior. The, the kind of alien metaphor of colonization. We are colonizing Africa, and the Mars is going to Mars is going to colonize us. Except they're bubbling up from the deep Earth, which is funny because he was the secretary for colonies. That's yeah. I think that that's worth stressing. Yeah, Though, I mean, there's lots more things in Viril. He's sort of um, is very interested in the shapes of people's skulls. He's got that like shape of skull equals character. Yeah, and he's got a really silly bit about their language. Yeah, you can see how the shadow of evolution. It's kind of lying all over, all over this. So it is, but it's evolution, not the way that we think of it as a controversy, but it's evolution like something un- which is an uncertain thing that at the, at the like proposed theoretical extent of science. Yeah. It is an unproven, it's like string theory or something. Um, but that's real. Actually, um, it wasn't a bad read. It's quite short. Kind of a strange one. And a literary sensation. Yeah. Sold millions. <laughs> sold millions and produced an entire kind of economy of tat. There were lots of like dressing up parties to be like these people. And people made loads of tat. The most famous example by far now is Bovril. Bovril, yes. Me- beef extract. Beef extract. Life it force. Can, it can occasionally be had at um, lower league football matches. And yeah, it's like um, beef tea. And it's, yeah, the bovine life force. And then it also has this peculiar afterlife in kind of mysticism. Yeah, taken up by the Nazis. <laughs> Theosophy is a sort of mid- middle stage, and then it, yeah, it ends up with the Nazis. Who, who oh, um, it doesn't stop there. I mean, it ca- <laughs> carries on with all sorts of strange people. It kind of spawns people who sort of take it on as real. I think partly because it's possibly slightly less strange than it seems, because vitalism, I mean, it was a bit strange to be thinking this in the 1870s but earlier was kind of a completely viable yeah maybe 50 years earlier like when bull willison was young this was a totally viable scientific sort of theory yes but i guess what sustains it is that is its complementarity to the idea of machinic energy it's a place where you can have like seances it's where you can sort of bring seance hypnotism and electricity and and like mechanical stuff all together in one grand unified theory of nonsense because the machine is either alive or it isn't, but e- each of those things. And it's not so ridiculous. We don't know what makes things conscious. We have no idea at all. Why is it ridiculous that would be to do with electricity? But yeah, that's real. Yeah. And then you have this non-sequel. Yeah, and then this is a strange thing because both. I mean, that was published. I th- was real published initially anonymously. Anonymously. Yeah, I think so, and I imagine that's because of the controversial content, but also because he had an existing reputation for a certain kind of like adventure story. Yeah, yeah. historical fiction. He yeah. like a number of 
He he's the guy who invented it was a dark and stormy night. No, he's came with some other phrases. He's another he's uh, like Pope, someone who The pen of- is mightier than the sword, that's one. It's very sort of kitsch or you know, it's like over the top. But I mean it is Georgian. So we're just gonna pause there for a message from our sponsor. The Great Courses Plus dot com. What's the Great Courses Plus? It's a online streaming learning service. Yes. Yes. They have thousands of lectures by experts in their field in a very broad variety of subjects of general interest and professional development or and personal development, sorts of cooking and craft and whatnot as well. History, art, literature, astronomy, all sorts of improving subjects. Also, a certain amount of art, architecture, subjects of general cultural interest if you're wanting to build the foundations of your knowledge. The general format, certainly for the ones I've been looking at, are these courses which develop a theme over a number of short episodes. So They're, they're generally are, half an hour, so you can fit them in, yeah. in in your downtime, get one done in your lunch break. But that also allows them to go pretty in-depth on specific topics, you know, treat the subject with the appropriate level of rigour. So I've been enjoying what I'm told is a brand new course, The Architecture of Power, Great Palaces of the Ancient World, which explores spectacular palaces, the stories around them. But I think for me, particularly interestingly, the way in which architecture relates to the kind of specific culture, ideology and personal kind of tastes and interests of the rulers who constructed them. So I've been watching a particular episode, which is the Wei Yang Palace, the palace built by the Han dynasty in China. So built by the second emperor and described in this rather amazing sounding text called the Western Capital Rhapsody which sounds a little bit like a Chinese version of Pliny's letter about the villas, going through all of these different spectacular spaces and describing them in order. The palace itself is almost completely scrubbed from the map. It doesn't really exist, but it's reconstructed with the use of illustrations and also 3D models for this episode, which is quite helpful. We learn about um, both the way in which these nested courtyards and spaces create a kind of diagram of the social hierarchy of the Chinese imperial court and system, um, and also hear a lot about these quite amazing works of art which were created. This is, after all, the era of the terracotta warriors and so on. I particularly love these descriptions of these trees which are made of jade, whose branches are made of coral, and whose leaves are made of this kind of dark green jadeite, which are obviously like a virtuosic piece of art, but also a very clear metaphor of eternity, the power of the emperor over time itself. Yeah, one of the reasons the Qing Empire failed was that the um, insane son set about this mega project of lacquering the city walls of Chang'an. Well, uh, there's lots more like that, and I'm looking forward to watching some others from the series. If it sounds like something you could be interested in, then there's something you need to know, which is that we've got a special offer. Time limited. Time limited. Get it Get it while it's hot. A full three month of unlimited access to the entire The Great Courses Plus library. But you need to use our special URL, which is thegreatcoursesplus.com slash buildings. Thegreatcoursesplus.com slash buildings. That's it. And in that time, you can watch as many of the videos as you want. So, um... Why wouldn't you? Thanks a lot to The Great Courses Plus for sponsoring our show. So, we can go on to everyone. I mean, Samuel Butler's quite a different sort of character. He's the son of a minister in the Church of England. The biographical note is that his father probably didn't want to become a minister in the Church of England. It is the thing you do with people who are unsuited to anything else. Yeah, well, then Samuel, who was meant, after going to university, was meant to be ordained also didn't want to but he actually did something about it and what he did was that he moved to New Zealand and worked uh, on sheep farms and the genesis of Erewhon or at least the, certainly the uh, what, what seems to be the earliest part of it is this curious essay he called Darwin Among the Machines which was published in some kind of not very large circulation journal in the 1860s so the book itself is a funny It's a bit of a uh, kind of Frankenstein's monster. It is made up of an initial bit, which is 
it's sort of like nature writing. Or maybe a bit like Mungo Parks. A sort of explorer. A little bit of both, which is quite beautiful. It's lovely. It was a very enjoyable read, that. And then uh, the, main, the main part of the novel is, or at least the longest part of the novel, is this thing which is a kind of hybrid between Jonathan Swift and, and Thomas More. So seeming like something from at least 100 years in the past, I would say, which is this description of this strange utopia in very satirical terms. It's another u- utopia kind of in inverted commas where, like, you can view it as a perfect society or you can view it as a deeply imperfect society and it's certainly a strange one. And the one thing which you have to know about this society is that it is one which, rather like Wakanda, uh, developed in, in, like, in secrecy, developed machines which were like vastly ahead of technology in Europe and the rest of the world but then deliberately abolished and forswore them. And the reason for their decision to do that is contained with this text, within this text, within the text, which is called the Book of the Machines, which is said to be the musings of this particular philosopher who saw what the fate of society would be if the machines were allowed to go on developing and who kind of convinced everyone else that they had to be got rid of. And that is the text which we heard from at the start and which seems like it comes from 100 years in the future. We should say that the protagonist is a particular kind of character, isn't he? He's, he's a bit of a buffoon. He's someone with a very Victorian sort of sense of yeah. confidence. There's a degree of satire in his character. Um... He, at the beginning, he loves this sort of natural environment, finds it super beautiful, and every now and again is overcome by the idea that there might be gold in those hills or there might be another valley that he can like, turn into an enormous sheep plantation, thus winning huge wealth. The sort of moments of happiness is when he like, happens upon a, a load of little ducklings and boils them all up. Yeah, his capacity to observe like the beauty of the natural world, I think, is... Very sensitive and kind of unfeigned. I mean, I wonder yeah, if I can find. Really clearly... He goes into these like reveries of, and and really kind of beautiful descriptions of sheep farming and the you know the mount the beautiful mountains and streams and the countryside, the little birds hopping around and singing. They're right at the frontier in terms of mid nineteenth century. New Zealand is fairly new land in terms of white colonial settlement, and they're making money basically by growing sheep and selling wool. You know, someone, it's open pasture. So it's these huge herds of sheep in the, in the valley. They build a big hall. The, the wool is sheared, sorted out, sent down the river. Up comes the brandy uh, and other necessities of life. Kind of this amazing frontier vision in this, yeah, Lord of the Rings scenery. And he also has religious experiences all the time. When he's in the great big wool hall, he feels it's like the secular cathedral yeah. and feels a connection with God in this huge... Or is it, you know, the uncertainty of religion? The weather was delightfully warm, considering that the valley in which we were encamped must have been at least 2,000 feet above the level of the sea. The riverbed was here about a mile and a half broad and entirely covered with shingle over which the river ran in many winding channels, looking, when seen from above, like a tangled skein of ribbon glistening in the sun. We knew that it was liable to very sudden and heavy freshets, but even had we not known it, we could have seen it by the snags of trees, which must have been carried long distances, and by the mass of vegetable and mineral debris, which was banked up against their lower side, showing that at times the whole riverbed must be covered with a roaring torrent many feet in depth and of ungovernable fury. On either side of it, there were still a few acres of flat, which grew wider and wider down the river, till they became the large plains on which we looked for my master's hut. Behind us rose the lower spurs of the second range, leading abruptly to the range itself, and, at a distance of half a mile, began the gorge, where the river narrowed and became boisterous and terrible. The beauty of the scene cannot be conveyed in language. The one side of the valley was blue with evening shadow, through which loomed forest and precipice, hillside and mountain top, and the other was still brilliant with the sunset gold. The wide and wasteful river, with its ceaseless rushing, the beautiful water birds too, which abounded on the islets and which were so tame that we could come up close to them, the ineffable purity of the air, the solemn peacefulness of the untrodden region, could there be a more delightful and exhilarating combination? Essentially what happens is that he's in this shearing job, 
there are various colonials like himself, and then there are also some of the natives who've been employed, and there's one particular called Chowbok. A most hideous fellow. He has this sort of ongoing project that he wants to baptise Chowbok. But it's, it's really funny because he wants to baptise him because he feels that, like... That'll mean he's definitely going to have a place in heaven. He has this sense of regret for some thing that he doesn't say quite what in his past, and he's looking for a way to expiate it. Anyway, he do, at some, there's one point where, in this rather pathetic way, he kind of improvises a sort of ersatz baptism with like a, a pannikin and uh, some river water. And the, some missionaries have given Chalbok um, this prayer book. He reads the basically the bit that he remembers of it is that it's been sponsored by this aristocratic woman who he regards as a god. So the, the project is to go up into the mountains and to try and discover, well he thinks that he's going to discover rich new lands to which he can stake some kind of claim. The range is considered to be impassable but he thinks that there is more to it than meets the eye and initially tries to get Chowbok to show him but um, over the co- over the course of the few weeks they spend exploring he starts to realise that Chowbok keeps steering him away from one particular gorge. And earlier on, he's he's gone into this strange trance as well, Chowbok, when he was explaining it. And um, there's obviously something strange in one place, strange and fearsome. While he has to do various kind of adventurous things, swim across a river, go down some sort of precipices which are impossible to get back up. Because he'd been living on the frontier, he's good at describing these, how you make a raft, how you um, catch the birds to and how you make your supper and all that sort of stuff. Brandy is very, very important substance for life. Yeah, brandy is what you do if you're if you're soaked through. You just drink some brandy. And it yeah, yeah. If you're right if, you, if you're feared, you drink brandy. If things are going hard, brandy will make it better. There's a point when he's worried that he's going to die because his brandy is running low. Well, by a series of adventures, it sort of makes his way through these mountain passes. On the way, passing a series of ingeniously crafted statues, which make horrible sounding booming noises in the wind they've got hollow heads and the wind sort of goes through the back of their head through their mouth making a sound and they're horribly disfigured yeah they scare been scaring away all the all the natives on the other side of that he penetrates into this new kingdom this new realm which yeah. is which is Erewhon. He's very worried. He hears he sort of notices this human habitation figured out this way the place that he wants to go to this valley which he wants to get for sheep farming, um, and they notice it's inhabited, and he's terrified with this encounter. But it turns out they're quite civilized. This is definitely a utopian trope: is that you know he's tired out, he sort of wanders down into some farmland and falls asleep, and then he wakes up, and the first thing he sees are some incredibly beautiful women. All, all the utopias have super beautiful people, particularly super beautiful women, and you're going to fall in love with one of them. This is like this happens in every single one. The genre of utopian. Uh, and satirical fiction is a subgenre of romance. Yeah. They're all romance novels. The plot always hinges on a romance. Yeah. With the protagonist, normally, the structure is with the protagonist and a figure who sort of represents the perfect society. One thing about the society is that it is presented as, it's kind of quasi-European in the, its descriptions. Yeah, it's like, they're like, it's sort of like Tuscany. <laughs> it's sort of a bit like Tuscany and a bit like Switzerland. And yeah. it has lovely weather Everyone's very beautiful and healthy. They have charming little villages. Unfortunately, he's straight away put in prison. Quite a benevolent prison. Yes. And that's because they're worried that he might be ill. Well, two things. That and also he's got a watch. The latter is considered a pretty serious violation, but because he's an outsider, they're prepared to go sort of easy on him. And they just... Not particularly because he's an outsider, but um, because he's blonde, blue-eyed and quite tall. They, they think that he's a good physical specimen. The illness thing is one of these things where I thought it had real echoes of like Thomas More, these funny inversions. So this is a society in which essentially the roles played by crime and illness have been inverted so that illness is considered to be a moral outrage illness and any misfortune you can be put on trial for being swindled out of an inheritance as a child whereas crime is considered to be something very unfortunate and for which you need to receive sympathy it's more like misfortune is criminal and like disease or bad luck and failings of character you know being an alcoholic being a, a, a violent person being a swindler or a crook these are 
like diseases. At the end of the third month, the jailer and my instructor came to visit me and told me that communications had been received from the government to the effect that if I behaved well and seemed generally reasonable, and if there could be no suspicion at all about my bodily health and vigour, and if my hair was really light and my eyes blue and com complexion fresh, I was to be sent up at once to the metropolis in order that the king and queen might see me and converse with me, but that when I arrived there I should be set at liberty and a suitable allowance would be made me. My teacher also told me me that one of the leading merchants had sent an invitation to repair to his house and consider myself his guest for as long a time as I chose. He is a delightful man, continued the interpreter, but has suffered terribly from. Here there came a much longer word, which I could not quite catch, only it was much longer than kleptomania, and has but lately recovered from embezzling a large sum of money under singularly distressing circumstances. But he has quite got over it, and the straighteners say he has made a really wonderful recovery. You are sure to like him. After he's released from prison, he goes to live with this family. Who are the richest merchants. The husband has, unfortunately, was taken in with a terrible case of embezzlement, but he's he's getting better now. And he does have to have a kind of corrective applied, which is that he's... Um, Self-flagellation... <laughs> beaten and has to drink milk or something like that but better better him than the poor rich widow that he swindled who was only saved from a from a terrible jail s sentence by the fact that she mercifully died if you want to get out of some kind of social engagement the thing which you're meant to say is that unfortunately you stole a pair of socks from the market earlier in the day <laughs> this is the equivalent of having a cold you were overcome the reader will have no difficulty in believing that the laws regarding ill health were frequently evaded by the help of recognised fictions, which everyone understood, but which it would be considered gross ill-breeding to even seem to understand. Thus, a day or two after my arrival at the Nosnibors, one of the many ladies who called on me made excuses for her husband's only sending his card, on the ground that when going through a public marketplace that morning he had stolen a pair of socks. I had already been warned that I should never show surprise, so I merely expressed my sympathy and said that, though I had only been in the capital for so short a time, I had already had a very narrow escape from stealing a clothes brush, and that though I had resisted temptation so far, I was sadly afraid that if I saw any object of special interest that was neither too hot nor too heavy, I should have to put myself in the straightener's hands. I think they have like an aunt in the house who everyone knows suffers from terrible indigestion but she pretends to be an alcoholic yeah she has to pretend to be a dipsomaniac <laughs> to cover up cover up the shame of having indigestion it's also sort of a crime to be poor there's a child being prosecuted for having their inheritance embezzled isn't there at yeah. one point yeah he's given hard labor but there's a man with pulmonary consumption who um has this big trial his defense is that he's pretending to have pulmonary consumption so that he can defraud an insurance company but no one believes him, <laughs> <But> no one <laughs> believes him. <laughs> and he in the end has to acknowledge his guilt of having it and um has got to spend the rest of his life in hard labor which will definitely kill him one of the themes in all of them well we didn't really talk about it in real is sort of there is crime punishment and order in society and how the victorian order is palpably unjust yeah hypocritical i mean we could say that our contemporary order is slightly hypocritical but it really hasn't had the edges sanded off it in the way that um uh, law really was protecting property rather than people and punishments were crueler than they are now and i think it's just a sort of swifty and satire in that he's not really proposing a solution i think it's also about the way in which the system of punishment tended to reproduce the conditions which it was sort of supposedly meant to, de to deter. Here people literally get iller in prison yeah. because they're having to do hard work in prison when they're ill. And in fact, he says, people, even people with only a mild aim, ailment will go to prison and catch all the horrible diseases that are about there, and then they will go out and become recidivist ill people. And if only in prison there was some sort of medical treatment. <laughs> <laughs> liberal fantasy among the Erewhonians. Yeah. There's a clandestine network of doctors that people... Um, yeah, only the, stra yeah, the straighteners are, the, are the, like, the moral doctors, and they're allowed to be around. Um, but people who actually attend to your health are considered to be quacks. No, they're criminals. Yeah, there's an underground network. They're banned. Because if you had doctors... If you had doctors, then people might think it was much more reasonable to be ill. Oh dear, that would never do.
I mean, he he was an he was an atheist, wasn't he? And he had obviously developed a bit of a a kind of a resentment to organised religion. I'm not sure if he's a full-blown atheist, but he's certainly a sort of agnostic. There is a lot of satire of religion, particularly the satire of the business of making people at a young age into priests, which will then mean that they can't do anything else. Yeah, the main satire of religion comes in the form of these organisations called the, the musical banks, which are a kind of main civic building in the city. There are two systems of money. There's a normal one. There's, a, there's the real one, which is sort of shady and people don't like to talk about. And there's the one that everyone pretends to use, which is the worthless musical money. Yes, the, mu- the money from the musical banks, which cannot be used for anything, but which is necessary always to hold a certain amount of. And there are these beautiful grand old be- buildings with strange, grumpy custodians. And you have to go in and turf over a certain amount of real money. And turn it into this imaginary money, most of which you just throw away. <laughs> or just give to someone else or whatever. Yeah. And people people become the tellers in these at young ages and then can't escape the job and can't really do anything else. Yeah, he has a funny bit where he says that the, um, that the musical bank was known to have paid a dividend around 30,000 years ago. Oh, it, 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 always, it always pays a dividend once every 30,000 years. Yes. <laughs> but the last dividend was only 3,000 years ago, so people don't hold out much hope of getting any reasonable dividends in the future. And there's a bunch of these other ones. There's something called the birth formula, which is a little bit like original sin, but in the form of a, a kind of contract which is imposed on the unborn. He, well, he also inverts religion by saying that their religion doesn't have a heaven but everyone is pre-existing before they're born and they're in this sort of immaterial immortal state and if they get really bored they pester people in order that they be born and they drive people to such lengths that then yeah a contract is with the with the new child who's this pre-existing person which basically signs over all the rights of the child yes in return for being allowed to be born there's the whole kind of satire of education, there's the whole satire of all sorts of different things. I'm not sure that we necessarily need to go through all of them. It goes to, like, Oxford, except it's their Oxford. Yeah, it's another inversion. The idea is that, so if you wanted to do art, for example, yeah. you're not allowed to practice art until you've learnt its full commercial history. You have to know the value of all the paintings and how much they go up and down. Again, it's this kind of um, satire of, like, 19th century teaching. Tedious art history, yes. They do. They do half. They do like half painting classes and half what what causes the value to go up and down and um, how much these paintings were all worth. It's quite acute and it's quite a, it's quite funny. But it's also it's it's not totally savage. He's quite tender about these places as well. Yeah, and I think I like his style. Like he's it's quite a, it's quite kind of. It's sort of light, it's sort of droll. Um, he's, he kind of just attacks everything as well. He's got a thing where he goes, the society all became vegetarian after someone preached the, you know, killing. And then another person started preaching that because animals were just evolved from plants and plants were just as capable of becoming something as animals um, and, you know, a plant can both reason and think in various sort of strange ways. It should also be illegal to eat plants. But then there's nothing to eat. They can eat yellow cabbage leaves and, like, apples that are no longer longer capable of producing trees. The vegetarians are allowed to eat meat of animals which have been killed by accident and rotten eggs. (laughs) And and that the eggs are, are like, produced and then if they've been left for for... They get, like, a stamp... And if you leave them for three months, you may have them after that, because after that period, they won't be able to um, produce chickens. After they decide that that you're not allowed to kill animals, but you are allowed to eat them if they've died by accident or by their own hand. Yes, or and by suicide. <laughs> <laughs> animal suicide. So, so, <laughs> there's all these suicidal animals. <laughs> it's like, very sorry, yeah. This, yeah. This ca- this cow yes, which is well, which is a well known practice in dogs and no, in dogs and donkeys, <laughs> known to be suicidal. But hitherto, it had not been known that pigs were quite so suicidal. I mean, I think, in one sense, it's all like completely, it's completely nonsensical and kind of surreal. He loves sort of thinking up these exotic kinds of hypocritical behaviour, doesn't he? Yeah. That's the thing which comes through again and again is that they're totally hypocritical. Yeah. It's sort of, I, I mean, if he has any position that you can work out, it's that you should be sceptical and sort of have a slightly conservative notion of common sense. Okay, so let's talk about the Book of the Machines. This is more famous probably than the work as a whole. Yeah. Or it certainly had a kind of like weird niche afterlife. You can see why that is. It is 
because it's like what we would today call a theory fiction or a, like a speculative fiction. It's ambiguously positioned between theory, philosophy, with the special license of sort of fictional or fantastical practice as well. Yeah, which is kind of the format of all of these things. No, I think this is specific because th- this is this is a story without characters. Yeah. It's like a philosophical musing. The text within the text, which is kind of like the, the letter that's discovered, or, you know, yeah. in this case, it's the text of the philosopher from 200 years ago. Well, it's so funny because it's a gloss. It's a gloss of a of his translation of a lost work of this ancient future thing. And it is also completely fascinating. So as you heard at the beginning of the programme, it starts off with this consideration of may not machines develop consciousness? Isn't consciousness something which at some point is not there and then later on is there? That the mollusk may not be conscious, that someday the mollusk is going to turn into an elephant or whatever, and at that point it certainly is going to be. Yeah, and he says, well, you could say that plants can't think, but they make decisions. Yeah, so he talks about um, the carnivorous plants, and he says, if it seems to us that the plant kills and eats a fly mechanically, then may it not seem to the plant that a man must kill and eat a sheep mechanically? (laughs) It may be said that the plant is void of reason, because the growth of a plant is an involuntary growth. Given earth, air and dew temperature, the plant must grow. It is like a clock, which being once wound up, will go till it is stopped or run down. But can a healthy boy help growing, if he have good, good meat and drink and clothing? Can anything help going as long as it is wound up, or go on after it is run down? Even a potato in a dark cellar has a certain low cunning about him, which serves him in excellent stead. He knows perfectly well what he wants and how to get it. He sees the light coming from the cellar window and sends his shoots crawling straight there too. They will crawl along the floor and up the wall and out at the cellar window. If there be a little earth anywhere on the journey, he will find it and use it to his own ends. And I think that kind of demonstrates it is, it's kind of amusingly written and also... And it's not in his own voice. No, it's not. The voice the voice is very carefully chosen, isn't it? It's yeah. kind of like a Church of England sermon voice, actually, isn't it? Do you think he's kind of ventriloquizing like his father or people he's heard? Yeah, it's a distant... Because it's funny, because what, what notionally this essay is, is he is translating this ancient, long ancient work of history, which has justified this society to destroy the machines. And then his, his kind of work is cut off and he loses the original manuscript and he's just got this gloss which is so it's like his gloss of someone else's writing which has some quotes in it um, and it has also bits where he goes sort of like and then he goes on for ages the potato says these things by doing them which is the best of languages you can see why people have been into this so yeah i mean he kind of goes through this setting up and then knocking down of objection of of attempt to create a like a difference of absolute quality between conscious and non-conscious life essentially yeah yeah which i mean it's quite doable really because we do not know how consciousness works so it's quite possible and another thing he sort of attacks i mean i don't know if you had a more specific is he is he kind of then goes on to attack where where a machine begins and ends and where a person begins and ends yeah so he has an idea of how machines uh develop evolutionarily so he has the idea that that a watch may be the evolutionary development of a clock but he also kind of he doesn't quite formed it but he's thinking of the different levels in which evolution can act you know because it, the evolution acts on like what a thing which is a machine and a person together within a society so there's a there's a quite unsettling idea which come, which he posits in this quotation but other questions come upon us what is a man's eye but a machine for the little creature that sits behind in his brain to look through a dead eye is nearly as good as a living one for some time after the man is dead It is not the eye that cannot see, but the restless one that cannot see through it. Is it man's eyes, or is it the big seeing engine, which has revealed to us the existence of worlds beyond worlds into infinity? What has made man familiar with the scenery of the moon, the spots on the sun, or the geography of the planets? 
He is at the mercy of the seeing engine for these things, and is powerless unless he tack it onto his own identity and make it part and parcel of himself. And then he also talks about like calculators and yeah, we're talking we're talking mechanical calculators here. Well, I mean that was the th- that was the th- the thing yeah, you were saying, then, wasn't it? And, but and, but then he says the machine doesn't seem to evolve because it can't reproduce itself, but it can reproduce itself because it's useful to us. You can either say that we force it to do things, or it, by being useful, forces us to develop it. And it's by that sort of same, and he says that process is inevitable. They may seem to be in a position where machines cannot reproduce, but a machine can make a thimble. And why should a machine have to reproduce itself? And then he sort of muses, but actually... Is it the machine which is alive or has the potential for living? Or is it the whole system or the whole kind of economy of machines? Even just all the machines together without the humans, slowly. And um, then he obviously is beginning to muse, well, the machines evolve far faster than humans do. So one day we will be in a position where where the machines will have a greater intellect than the people. Yeah, the machines at the moment are not our kind of... They're not fertile in the way that animals are, in the case of being able to perfectly reprodu- reproduce themselves. And, but he says it also isn't necessary that they ever become that. Like, you can have a whole economy of machines which reproduces itself as an entire... Like the eye, it's just you can view as the machine yeah. um, in part of a greater machine, a human, and a human cannot exist on their own. Yeah. They cannot survive. And in fact, society cannot survive without machines... You can say that the machines cannot survive without the entire economy, but that doesn't mean they're any less susceptible to evolution or potentially to consciousness or intelligence. So here's a bit. He says, The very nature of the motive power which works the advancement of the machines precludes the possibility of man's life being rendered miserable as well as enslaved. Slaves are tolerably happy if they have good masters, and the revolution will not occur in our time, nor hardly in 10,000 years, or ten times that. Is it wise to be uneasy about a contingency which is so remote? Man is not a sentimental animal where his material interests are concerned, and though here and there some ardent soul may look upon himself and curse his fate that he was not born a vapour engine, yet the mass of mankind will acquiesce in any arrangement which gives them better food and clothing at a cheaper rate, and will refrain from yielding to unreasonable jealousy merely because there are other destinies more glorious than their own. So there he's literally saying, in the future it might be that kids are unhappy that they weren't born a machine because the machines are so much more brilliant powerful and intelligent than they are which seems to us like a particular obsession of the moment with kind of artificial intelligence panic or whatever but the idea that the machine is becoming the actor of history that really the machines are the ones who are destined for glory sort of again kind of colonial fear the white man is instead of the, the machine is going to have the whip hand over him (laughs) <laughs> to use, um, you know, the Latin. and we're going to be like natives in this colony of robots. It's worth saying this was written in the 1860s, which is very early. It's quite early, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. like, you know. <sighs> so I think that the book itself came out in 1871, which it coincides with the famous gallery of the machines in Paris. Well, this was written before then anyway, but I, know, I don't actually know whether Butler saw this or not, but in some way he seems to imagine it. I mean, there'd been earlier, the Great Exhibition, the most popular thing in the Great Exhibition, I mean, most of it was like bad art, but the most popular thing were these huge machines, which people in London hadn't really seen before, the great steam engines being shown off. Although the 1860s is early, it's in living memory of the shock of... The shock of the new, you know. When Bulwer-Lytton was young, there was no such thing as railways. It took weeks to get around England. And then when he was writing in this time, there were hundreds of train station stops. The the first big railway boom is in the 1840s. Yeah, so so Butler would have been a child. But it was written in New Zealand. Yeah, I know. Where there definitely isn't any of that. I mean, (laughs) like, in the 1860s, a lot of trade was conducted with sailing ships. Most trade was conducted with sailing ships. You're beginning to get tramp steamers. The wool was being taken back probably by sail. I think that there's also something which, in a way, is sort of prefiguring the anxieties of cyberpunk, this idea that by living with machines, the integrity and autonomy of the body is being kind of compromised. It's fragmenting into these different possible 
this all machine-like components, and it's also becoming conjoined to these machinic yeah. infrastructures. Well, because you've got now the metaphor of before, you just had life, and you had machines which, I mean, he even talks about this category of like a machine which is powered only by people. You know, a spanner, a knife. And then there's the sort of machines which have their own power, a steam engine, yeah. a textile mill. Yeah. And you're starting to develop machines where you can see how the compounding complexity w leads to them being able to take on more and more functions that were previously regarded as things that life did. For a long time, it was thought that life was something fundamentally different. Now, life is like, there's nothing special about it at all. It's completely dominated by the normal rules of physics, except for consciousness. Because once you say life is the same as matter, living things are very complex machines. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of these kind of very enjoyable metaphors by which he makes these points. Machines are to be regarded as the mode of development by which human organism is now especially advancing, every past invention being an addition to the resources of the human body. Even community of limbs is thus rendered possible to those who have so much community of soul as to own money enough to pay a railway fare. For a train is only a seven-leagued foot that 500 may own at once. Yeah, and in his society, not this isn't in the, the book overall, but a society without machines, but where the wealth of an individual is assessed by the power, as in the horsepower or watts, that they can command. You know, he's a two million horsepower man. Yeah, his, his rich friend. Because that power is regarded as an extension of his self. There's also this funny little, I mean, this is to extend the kind of evolutionary metaphor more generally uh, to the products of design and art, really. But there's a, a, he, rem, he recalls an analysis that someone did of his tobacco pipe. He says that he examined it carefully and where he came to a little protuberance at the bottom of the bowl, he seemed much delighted and exclaimed that it must be rudimentary. By which he means vestigial. Sir. He answered, this organ is identical with the rim at the bottom of a cup. It is but another form of the same function. Its purpose must have been to keep the heat of the pipe from marking the table upon which it rested. You would find, if you were to look up the history of tobacco pipes, that in early specimens this protuberance was of a different shape to what it is now. It would have been broad at the bottom and flat, so that while the pipe was being smoked the bowl might rest upon the table without marking it. Use and disuse must have come into play and reduced the function to its present rudimentary condition. I should not be surprised, sir, if, in the course of time, it were to become modified still farther and to assume the form of an ornamental leaf or scroll, or even a butterfly, or, in some cases, it will become extinct. It's weird, isn't it? It's in the middle of this novel, isn't it? It's kind of strange. It's a really unclassic, like, it's a real weird book. Because it then goes on to become a novel again. Yeah, it goes on to become a, no a novel. So, what, uh, in terms of the plot, what happens is that well, we can just we can just say that well, since you've said it before, you know, romance is involved. Escape becomes necessary. The purpose of the book emerges at the end. It emerges at the end that the narrator is writing this whole book because he's trying to make a plea to you know stockholders to raise money so that they can all go back to Erewhon and realise the vast potential wealth from its development. There is enormous potential wealth, but this is only just a tool to convert the natives and thereby win spiritual rewards. Oh, yeah. And it's always this sort of... It's kind of playing around with the hypocrisy of justifying colonialism by missionary work when really it's commercial. Because all along, the, 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 the people he's thought of are, are probably the missing ten tribes. Oh, yeah, he thinks that they're one of the missing, ten, one of the missing tribes of Israel, yes. And that, um, you know, heaven is assured if, if he can convert them again. Uh, yeah, so he has this very kind of pious formulation, but uh, th then he sort of sets out how he thinks it might work in detail, and essentially it's the slave trade. He thinks that they... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what think, they're going to do is they're going to lure some of them off. Take them to Queensland to, take them to, to Queensland grow sugar to cane. To be slaves working on sugar plantations. <laughs> but, but they're going to be brought into the Christian faith and, yeah. then, um, and so on and so on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then at the end, he, you have this sort of moment at the end where he's, he's sort of like, I feel like something's not quite right in the and plan. And he sort of <laughs> says, some people might criticise this, but it's all for the greater glory of God. And there will be rich rewards along the way. It's very easy to get hold of on the interwebs. Out of copyright. 
the story of the machines is uh, like an absolutely essential yeah, piece of piece of early science fiction. I saw. I mean, I had I had heard of it, but I I don't know why it's not more. Yeah, famous. I think the book though overall is a good read. Um, I love the beginning kind of nature stuff. It's a really strange book. He was a funny character. He was a funny character, but like, I don't know enough about him. But I, he he seems he's an outsider. He's, he's a a trying a, to be a painter. He is a bit. Yeah, he's a bit out of place. He had he had a classic like outsider career, which is like bumble off to the colonies, bumble around, bumble back, try and be an artist. Accidentally make lots of money off your book. Accidentally make loads of money off the book because people think it's written by someone else. We were going to do all of this as one episode, but we realised we we'd got gone too far yes, down it was the rabbit six hole books, six books for one episode which is a bit too much well, because both of these although they're more or less utopian they're not so into the kind of detail of what the and they're also sort of thomas for... more utopia it's not a real utopia yeah. it's kind of got some it, it, you can glean from it some of what the author thinks a good society would be like but they are also satirical whereas i don't think some of the ones we're looking at the next one are satirical at all. No, they're much more to do with a real political programme. So we're going to be reading Looking Backwards, which is by Edward Bellamy, and which was an enormously successful book in its time, but now very little read at all. And then a few of the books which follow an attempt either to overturn or to sort of extend its yeah. proposition. So that would be News From Nowhere, Morris, by Morris. mentioned in a Ruskin episode. And probably Moving the Mountain. Yeah, by uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, which will take us almost up to the point of contact with our previous Dystopias episode into the earlier 20th century. And we're not quite sure what we're doing on the bonuses, but I think we're a lot of these books, because they're successful, they provoke all sorts of responses. So among them, Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground. I thought it might be nice to do a, yeah, what is to be done and Notes from the Underground kind of one so yeah do join us for that it's been this has been I like this one a bit wandering but these kind ones of are, fun these ones I've, we've already read the ones for the other one yeah these two are more fun to read remember that if you want to receive bonus content with every episode uh, you can do that by subscribing to our patreon at patreon.com slash about underscore buildings thank you very much to all of you who have it uh it's grown a bit now and thank you very much thank you very much it's all we really wouldn't be able to do as much content as we can without it. We'll f- find some suitably kind of interesting and resonant imagery which we'll be putting up on social media. Uh, we're on various things at about underscore buildings. Uh, and you can email us with thoughts, praise, censure at aboutbuildingsandcities at gmail.com. It's lovely when you do. Yes, it's, it's much, nice. appre- much appreciated. I hope you're all having a good 2019. This is our first... It's the first bit of recording we've done, actually. We've, yeah. Uh, yeah. Getting off to a slow start, but got lots planned. All right. Yeah. Good night. Good night.